Welcome to the Southwest Climate Adaptation Science Center's uh, springtime webinar series. I'm Carolyn Enquist. I'm the Deputy Director of the Climate Adaptation Science Center. Um, we've got a great program today, but I just wanted to share a little bit about the Southwest cast before we get started um, with today's presentation. All right. Can you see my screen? Just head, Sarah? We actually see your Zoom screen, not your presentation. OK, I'm going to stop share and go to this one. Can you see this? Nope. All right. And I'm going to try it once again. Um, while you're doing that, I just wanted to do a little bit of um, housekeeping, if that's okay. Um, so this webinar is the um, second in a series that we're doing this spring. And um, you can find the recording from the first webinar um, on our website. And I will um, post the link for that in the chat in just a few minutes. That first webinar was highlighting our tribal focused engagements and opportunities. And then our next webinar will be on May 7th where Connie Woodhouse uh, from the University of Arizona will describe her team's work uh, addressing the concerns of a set of Colorado River water managers regarding future drought and supply reliability in the upper Colorado River. Um, and then at the end of the webinar, we'll address any questions you have, but please throughout the webinar, you can add your questions in the Q&A window. And then lastly, at the end of the webinar, when you leave, you'll be directed to a very brief survey in your browser. Uh, so please take the time to let us know what you thought of the webinar and share your ideas for future webinar topics. Um, okay, thanks, Carolyn. I'll now turn it over to you. Great, thanks. Do you see my screen now, Sarah? Yes, yes, perfect. Okay, fantastic. Well, I'll get through this real quick. Um, so just to give you a little bit of background before we get started, um, I wanted to mention that the Southwest Climate Adaptation Science Center is one of nine regional uh, climate adaptation science centers. Um, we work uh, as part of the U.S. Geological Survey under the Department of Interior. Um, our centers focus specifically on climate adaptation science and solutions, and uh, we've been around for almost 10 years um, and really have enjoyed working with federal, state, tribal, regional, and local partners. The mission of our network is to work with natural and cultural research resource managers to co-develop and deliver scientific information, techniques, et cetera, to um, help prepare managers and the partners we work for to adapt and uh, um, to work in the context of climate change. Now, the Southwest Climate Adaptation Science Center um, is also a consortium of universities um, and as you can see here, we work with uh, seven universities across the region, in addition to a national tribal organization, um, the American Indian Higher Education Consortium. And AHEC uh, co-sponsors our Tribal Climate Liaison. And if you were on our previous webinar, you would have heard from our Tribal Liaison, Althea Walker. The CASC itself is based at the University of Arizona uh, in Tucson, and it's located on the ancestral homelands of the Tejano Autumn Nation and the Pascua Yaqui Tribe. Um, our staff consists of two USGS leads, uh, myself and Steve Jackson, and two university leads, Greg Garfin and Anita Gover. And we have uh, a 
the support of a whole series of folks that you can see here, including Sarah Leroy, um, who does an amazing job leading our communications. And with that, I'm going to stop sharing and uh, we're gonna get this started. Um, I really have the honor and privilege to introduce to you uh, three outstanding uh, researchers. Um, due to the interest, you know, due to just kind of our uh, time constraints, um, we're gonna keep our introductions on the short side. But if you're interested in learning more about each of these researchers, I invite you to do so. Sarah's putting a link to their bio sketches. Um, and I'm going to let each, each of them uh, provide a little bit of background. Um, so Phil, take it away. Great. Uh, thanks, Carla. Appreciate it. I'm going to try to share my screen here. And let me know if that is working for you all. And so the, the title of our, our talk today is Rebuilding Forests After Fire. Will Severe Fire Be a Catalyst for Forest Loss? And this is kind of a, a, a pressing concern uh, given the recent uh, fire year that we've had in California, but also it's an ongoing problem. Um, just for a brief introduction for myself, I'm uh, Phil Van Mankum. I'm a research ecologist with the US Geological Survey, Western Ecological Research Center. I'm stationed in Arcata, California. My uh, research interest is, has been forest ecology over the last ooh, almost 30 years now. Before we launch into this uh, too deeply, I'd like to first of all thank our first for this, is the Southwest uh, Climate Adaptation Science Center also the ecosystem mission area from USGS, and of course, a whole slew of co-authors. Uh, so um, thanks to all. So for me, this is kind of an iconic image. It was taken by Carrie Vernon, who was uh, NPS Hell Attack at uh, Sequoia Kings. And this is an image of the 2016 rough fire making sort of a large run up in uh, Sierra National Forest. And so not only can you see the high severity fire, but you also see some of these brown trees that were impacted by a recent drought there. And so this to me sort of combines some of the, the stressors and problems that Western forests are facing right now. So it's not just one stressor, it's many. And here's the climatic context uh, for some of these stressors. So this is just uh, statewide California averages for temperature in red and then precipitation in blue put together by one of our co-authors, Jim Thorne out of UC Davis. So the obvious thing that you can notice is that temperatures are climbing over time. Uh, what's less obvious is that there's no real pattern, immediate pattern in precipitation, but you get a suggestion that there's an increasing volatility in, in precipitation. So just the magnitude of those peaks and troughs are getting wider. Also, the recent drought is in that sort of shaded bar off to your right, and you can see increasing temperatures decreasing precipitation. So we're having hotter droughts and that stresses vegetation more than a regular drought. Uh, we also have one of the things going on in the West that probably not surprising to most people is that we have increasing incidence of large fires. So this is a study put together in 2014 by Denison et al. And just looking at across ecoregions in the Western US. And so generally the general pattern is that we have increasing incidence of large fires. And that's also true for our area of interest, uh, the Sierra Nevadas and the Klamaths, so in California. That's not true everywhere. So you can go to, say, Southern California Chaparral, and you don't see those trends. They're, they're not really, uh, those fires are driven by different things. So what we're, what we're seeing here is essentially the, the consequence of a century of fire exclusion, allowing fuels to build up. But there's also a climatic signal behind those patterns as well. Another thing that has been popping up recently is that we have more high severity fire. And that's important for a couple of reasons. This is an image of the uh, 2018 car fire in California. And these red patches show uh, the, the sort of our assessment of immediate post burn conditions. And this, some of these red patches in the middle here are over a mile across. So those are large patches of high severity fire where almost all of the 
overstory trees have been killed. And that's a problem for a couple of reasons. Forests in these areas haven't been, aren't adapted to high severity fire. So they don't have sea banks. They don't generally re-sprout following fire. And so in order for them to recover, they have to reproduce by seed. And that's a, that can be a problem in these high severity patches, especially when they're large because dispersal distances of seeds are very short, uh, generally on the order of maybe about 50 meters or so. And this is a study in, from Chambers et al. in 2016, looking at a series of fires in Colorado. But what they're able to show was that uh, up to a couple decades following uh, a fire in these areas, at 50 meters out, they're starting, they're stopping, uh, there's not really much evidence of good forest regeneration after that. So with increasing distance from the unburned edge of the forest, we have less regeneration. And this is what some of these post-fire landscapes look like. So this is the uh, aftermath of the car fire uh, taken in Whiskeytown Natural, uh, National Recreation Area. Uh, taken, this photo is taken by one of our colleagues, Eamon Engberg from the National Park Service. And the whole area of Whiskeytown doesn't look like this, but there are big chunks of it that do. And so we're left with sort of management questions of uh, essentially how, how can we sort of allow for us to be resilient to these sort of conditions, especially with these large high severity patches. So we have two major challenges. These high severity patch sizes increasing and there's long dispersal distances uh, that uh, for, to allow forests to recover from this. Also post fire weather, uh, sort of short term climate conditions might not be suitable for seedling establishments. They tend to be very uh, sensitive to changes in precipitation. And so if we're having increasing drought that might cause problems with forest recovery following fire. So that's the background for this. Uh, the, the roadmap for the rest of the talk is uh, I'm going to turn it over to Micah, who's going to be talking about patterns of conifer seed reproduction. He'll then turn it over to uh, Joseph, who will be talking about uh, spatially explicit predictions for post-fire uh, recovery. And then if we have time, I'd like to go over a user-friendly tool that uh, Micah and Joseph have put together looking uh, how can we prioritize areas for post-fire recovery or plantings. That is, if we're going to do management in these areas, can we start to come up with some sort of smart areas of uh, where and when we can apply the, these sort of treatments? And with that, I will turn it over to Micah. Okay, and I'm stopping sharing, I hope. Let me know if that's working. All right, um, my name is Micah Wright. I'm a biologist with USGS here in Arcata. Um, and I also uh, typically, my, my research interests are in forest ecology. Um, and Phil touched on this a little bit, but there was a, the, the last drought, or the, there was recently this pretty intense drought from about 2012 to 2017 throughout California um, that resulted in a lot of conifer mortality. And we were interested in looking at whether or not seed production changed during that drought. So this is just, this figure is just showing annual precipitation uh, temperature in summer climatic water deficit, which is just a, a drought metric, higher values means more drought essentially, um, from two different weather stations. One is in Grant Grove, which is in Sequoia Kings National Park, and then the other is in Yosemite. And we thought that uh, if, if there was a difference in seed production during the drought, it would, could take two possible, uh, Two possible paths, both are re uh, related to resource allocation. One, you'd see a pulse in regeneration, uh, which might be connected to what's called the terminal investment hypothesis, um, which just suggests that as organisms are stressed, they might preferentially allocate resources to reproduction. Um, alternatively, you could see a reduction in seed production as uh, trees allocate resources towards defense or survival. We were also interested in just looking at whether or not seed production tracked variation in local weather. Um, this could be due to resource availability, pollination efficiency, or some sort of weather cue. So conifers typically follow this, uh, conifer seed production rather, follows this masting pattern, which is the temporarily variable synchronous production of large seed crops. So this is a, this is a trace plot for seed production in a series of plots, so each line is the uh, seed output in that plot in that year. 
um, for firs, um, incense cedar, and pines. And you can see that typically there will be these years of large, uh, these large seed production years which are typically followed by a year or two of lower seed production, sort of in this synchronous pattern. And typically this is, this is not, it's actually not well understood, but it's typically thought of as a strategy to either satiate predators, um, increase pollination efficiency, or track resource availability. So we were able to leverage data from, I can't actually see the top of my screen, but 26 plots, four of which were in Yosemite over here, and 26 in Sequoia National Park. In a rate across those plots, we had 480 seed traps, which are just these little uh, wooden boxes that have a screen over the top. So the seeds can fall into the box, but squirrels and stuff can't get in there and eat it. And we had a pretty long period of data collection. So uh, 20 years from 1999 to 2018, which encapsulated pretty much the whole drought. So this is just an overview of the sample design. Um, this is a typical plot layout. And usually the plots had at least two regeneration subplots with nine seed traps in each arrayed like in a systematic pattern like that. Um, and the picture is just a photo of those seed traps. Um, and these are, they're laid out and they collect seed throughout the year, but seed typically falls mostly in the fall. Um, the traps are emptied the following spring after snow melt. And ideally this gives you a pretty good census of the seed rain from the following year, or sorry, the previous year. So for our primary, one of our primary research questions is whether or not the seed production differed between drought and the other years. However, because there's so much mortality, we also have to account for live basal area. So basal area is just, if you imagine cutting off a stand of trees at about four feet and then measuring the cross sections for each of the stems and adding all that up. Um, it's just essentially a way of thinking about how much wood is in the stand. And this correlates pretty well um, with more and or larger trees. Um, and this is just a figure showing live basal area over time in the subset of the plots um, for firs, pines, and, uh, or, and cedars. And the points or size is the actual seed production for that genus in that plot and it's ranked. Um, so we just wanted to see if, if the seed production during the drought, which is this gray band, was different than the other years. And though we did find small differences, they weren't statistically significant. So this is, these are just histograms showing uh, the relative seed production. So that's the seed production per unit area of wood essentially. Um, for each genus between the drought, which is in red, and the other years. And those vertical lines are just the means. Um, and so that our take home from this is that there wasn't really a detectable uniform drought response. So we were also interested in whether that seed production was tracking variation in local weather. Um, so we regressed live tree basal area, uh, seed production against live tree basal area, spring temperature, annual precipitation, and summer climatic water deficit. But these effects could vary depending on when those weather events occur in the seed production cycle. So we fit up to four separate models for each. So um, firs and cedars typically follow this two-year seed production cycle. So the buds are initiated in the fall, they're pollinated in the following spring, and then the cones mature and the seeds disperse the following fall. Whereas pines typically follow this three-year cycle. Um, where but the buds are initiated, pollinated the following spring, and then they mature for throughout the next year in, or throughout the year and into the next, and then um, are dispersed in the following fall. So we fit models looking at whether in the priming year, which is the year prior to the start of the reproductive cycle, an initiation year, which is the weather in that first year when uh, the initiation or sorry the seed production cycle starts, a pollination model, which is weather in the year of pollination and a maturation year model, which is whether in the year of seed maturation and dispersal. And for this two year, uh, for the, the species in the two year cycle, we just fit the three models because the um, pollination and maturation occur in the same year. And we found that essentially like one of the strongest uh, predictors was live basal area, which is sort of unsurprising, you know, more and or larger trees, you're gonna get more seed. Um, and these are just coefficient plots um, for standardized coefficients. So they're on the same scale. The points are the estimates with 95% confidence intervals uh, and the best performing models in red. 
However, the effects of weather vary by genus. So furs, we saw increased seed production with summer climatic water deficit in the maturation year. So the same year as pollination. For pines, we saw increased seed production with higher spring temperature in the pollination year. And for cedars, we saw a negative relationship to uh, seed production in, with uh, increased priming year precipitation. So why might this be? Um, again, the, the uh, live base layer makes a lot of sense. More indoor, bigger trees equals more seed. Oh, and these are uh, prediction plots for, so it's predicted, the lines are predicted seed production for a minimum and maximum basal area across the, uh, against plotted over the um, weather variable from the best performing model. And the points are the observed seed counts colored by whether or not it was a drought year. However, um, again, the effects of where weather vary by genus. Um, so, for furs, we saw this increased, pretty strong increase in seed production um, with increasing summer climatic water deficit. And this could be a drought signal, but it also may be related to pollination. So typically, warmer, drier weather just helps pollination occur a little bit better. Um, but we weren't able to tease that apart with the resolution of the data that we had. Um, similar with pines, we saw an increased seed production, but this time with uh, spring temperature in the pollination year. And this probably is pollination. Um, there's been a few other studies that have shown in, with a uh, ponderosa pine and a couple of other species showing an association between warm and dry springs and increased pollination efficiency. However, for incense cedar, it was a little bit of a head scratcher because incense cedar is actually the most drought tolerant of these. Um, but I think that what that suggests is that, that uh, the so you'd expect essentially the opposite effect, but probably spring temperature um, or spring, sorry, precipitation, annual precipitation is correlated with something that we didn't measure, like maybe survival of competitors or something like that. It's also possible that um, it just, you know, it was uh, overfitting noise in the model or something like that. So in conclusion, um, we found that seed production did, didn't differ systematically during the drought for surviving trees. And this suggests the primary effect of the drought on uh, regeneration appears to be just the removal of potential parent trees. And we found that the effect of local weather does affect seed production. However, this effect varies by species, but despite the large data set, the mechanisms behind those effects um, were hard to disentangle at this resolution. And with that, I'll turn it over to Joseph. Hi, everyone. Let me start sharing my screen. I am a uh, postdoc at UC Davis. Oops. There we go. Um, so I'm going to talk about a recent study we published in ecological applications. And the goals of the study were to synthesize both spatial and temporal predictors of post-fire conifer generation into a broadly applicable model. So that's one that managers can easily use after a fire to predict where regeneration is gonna occur naturally and use that in their post-fire regeneration planning. And also to build on previous models to make taxon specific predictions for particular groups of conifers, like pines and firs, as opposed to just all conifers as a whole. So we're building on some previous work in a previous spatial model. So this is work from Kristen Shive and collaborators. In the bottom right corner, you can see a spatial prediction for a new fire outside of the, the plots they use to parameterize the model. And this is for the King fire. And the colors uh, in this plot correspond to the predicted probability classes in the reliability diagram in the upper right corner just above. Now I'm gonna show you a couple different uh, reliability diagrams. So I'll take a second to go through this real quick. So on the horizontal axis, we've got the predicted probability of regeneration. And then, and that's binned into different classes ranging from zero to 20% probability of regeneration and upward from there. And then on the vertical axis, we've got the observed frequency of regeneration. 
Now these uh, reliability diagrams are produced with a leave one fire out cross validation approach where the model is parameterized with all the fires but one. And then that fire that's left out is used to assess the reliability of those predictions. And that's iterated over all of the fires in there. So you can think of the uncertainty as, uh, on this represented on this diagram um, as a representation of the uncertainty uh, that managers should expect when they're applying this model to new fires. And then the left, you've got uh, marginal response curves for all of the nine predictor variables included in the model. And we'll come back to those in a couple of slides. So one of the Shai et al's big uh, novel contributions was development of a seed availability proxy. And how does that work? How is it developed? Well, so you start off with pre-fire basal area. And here we're looking at a map for a particular species, in this case, white fir. Um, from there, you estimate the percent of live trees lost to fire. And that's done by uh, satellite imagery, that pre and post fire satellite imagery. And then uh, with uh, field collected data on the ground with pre and post fire basal area, you can translate that into a model of percent basal area loss. So you can combine panels one and two to come up with an estimate of post fire basal area you, uh, in panel three. Using allometric equations, you can come up with an estimate of average seed production for each of the 30 meter pixels inside of this fire that we're looking at right there. Now seeds are produced in particular pixels, but they can disperse through gravity or wind or other mechanisms. So after accounting for dispersal, we've got a, a new map of seeds that are falling on the ground. Incidentally, the uh, measure, the, the unit here is seeds per meter squared. And then you iterate over taxa for all of the, the species that you're interested in. So here we're looking at total seed production for both of the fur species, wet, white fur and red fur um, in this particular uh, area of the fire. Using much of the same data, Derek Young and collaborators wanted to know if post-fire weather was influencing regeneration of a number of species. But here I'm showing slides just for a couple of the conifer species. And they were interested in looking at that in a particular context so they could isolate the effect of post-fire weather and not um, uh, be detecting uh, effects from these other variables. So they looked particularly at high severity plots with nearby seed sources and had a few other ways that they subset the data. So the horizontal axis here, what you need to know is it's a metric of uh, how droughty the driest dry year was after the fire uh, in the three year interval. So you can see uh, more negative values when you've got drier conditions correspond with lower white fur regeneration and less dry conditions correspond with higher white fur regeneration. Now the same pattern wasn't found for yellow pine, um, but our question here is, you know, how generalizable is this? Can post-fire weather integrating that into a spatial model, such as the one that Kristen developed, be used, the Shaivadal model, be used to improve that model? So here's the data that we're working with for our model. So we uh, looked at data, post-fire uh, regeneration data from 19 different fires across California that burned between 2004 and 2012. Um, and the study plots were stratified across the fire and they're each 60 square meters in size or a 4.4 meter radius. And we looked at data that was collected exclusively five years post fire. And then in light green, you can see the location of the demography plots included in the study. And we subset down the demography plots to only include demography plots with similar species composition to the post fire regeneration plots. And we use a total of 216 seed fall traps. Uh, so coming back to the Shive et al. model, um, the reliability diagram there, you can see performs pretty well. This is a good starting point for trying to add in additional predictors um, and improve uh, predictions of post-fire regeneration. Um, but uh, as we're adding in new predictors, uh, you know, the more predictors that are in a model, the higher probability that you have for overfitting. So can we remove some of the existing predictors? And what we're going to start off by looking at looking for is um, potentially overfit relationships. So first I'll draw your attention to the upper right hand corner. So that shows the change in probability of regeneration uh, against on the horizontal axis time post fire. So the Shaivet model used data that was collected anywhere from one year after a fire 
to 12 years after the fire. And the general trend you see here is that with increasing time after fire, you get a lower probability of regeneration, at least according to this response curve. The other thing you see is that it's, it's wiggly, it's non-monotonic, it goes down and then comes up and then comes down again. And what we would expect mechanistically is more time progresses after a fire. There's more time for seeds to fall into the ground and germinate, more time for regeneration to occur. Um, certainly some seedlings die, but the general trend you'd expect is more of an upward trend as opposed to a downward trend. So how could we uh, fix this, uh, you know, a, a potentially overfit relationship? Well, it turns out most of the data uh, was collected five years post-fire. So if we just subset down and only use the data from five years post-fire, we can eliminate the need for including the time post-fire as a response variable. The next thing I'll draw your attention to is the four different historical climate predictors that are included in the model. So that's the bottom row and the middle right. And so those include annual precipitation, climate water deficit, snow water equivalent, and actual evapotranspiration. Now those are all measures of moisture availability or moisture stress, and they're all fairly strongly correlated with each other. And we know that we include multiple strongly correlated predictors in the same model. It's a recipe for you know, asking for overfitting the model. So can we reduce that set of climate predictors down? Um, you'll notice that uh, if you look at the chi-squared percent contribution score, annual precipitation is driving most of the relationship there with the other variables contributing relatively little. Also, you'll see the relationship for annual precipitation. This is historical annual precipitation. Uh, it makes a lot of sense with what we would expect a priori. Wetter conditions are associated with higher probability of regeneration. But if you look at the response functions for some of the other curves, that doesn't apply. There, there's a little bit of head scratchers and it's hard to untangle exactly what's going on there. So we're gonna reduce the uh, number of uh, predictor variables from the Shaivadal model just down to these five predictors and build from there uh, to add in additional predictors. The one other step that we took to uh, uh, reduce uh, potential for overfitting doesn't apply to the all conifer models, such as the one that uh, Shaiv et al. developed, but applies when you're looking at taxon specific predictors of regeneration. So here on the horizontal axis, this is seed availability, um, fur seeds in particular, and on the vertical axis, you've got probability of fur regeneration. Now the curve goes up, it peaks at moderate values, and then it goes down a little bit to the right, which doesn't conform with what we'd expect mechanistically. More seeds should translate to higher probability of regeneration. Now it could be that this relationship, that the decline we're seeing at very high seed availability could be driven by competition. We looked at that in some exploratory analyses and that doesn't seem to be the case. Um, but how can we fix this? By using shape-constrained additive models as opposed to generalized additive models, we can tell the model that we want it to be a, a response function that curves up and to the right. And here's the revised uh, response function once we use a shape-constrained spline, which starts off at uh, close to zero regeneration, at zero uh, estimated seed availability, and then uh, starts to come close to sort of asymptoting above 25 seeds per meter squared in line with what our expectations would be. We took some other steps to update the model as well, including Jay Miller was kind enough to share the raw data that he used uh, in uh, estimating per portion of basal area or uh, fire severity from relativized difference normalized burn ratio. Again, that satellite metric of burn severity. Um, so the raw data is shown in black. And in orange, you can see the stepwise function used by the Shive et al. model for translating our NDBR into a proportion of basal area lost from fire. And then in blue, you can see just the results of a logistic regression fit to that data. And the logistic regression is what we're going to use for estimating proportion of basal area lost from fire. This is uh, showing allometric equations for a couple different species for seeds per tree. Um, and you can notice that there's a very slight curve to the relationship. Smaller trees produce a little bit more seed per uh, basal area than larger trees. Uh, so we, we implemented the, the curved version of these equations as opposed to using a linearized version used in the Shive et al. model.
included precipitation, climate water deficit, vapor pressure deficit, measured at various different post-fire uh, intervals. Um, it's telling me my connection's unstable, so tell me if I'm cutting out. Um, ranging from anywhere from the first year, first water year post-fire to the first five water years post-fire. So this is our model comparison table. And what I'll point out is we've got three different response variables, probability of confer recruitment, probability of fur recruitment, and then probability of pine recruitment. And then our model evaluation metrics, again, using that leave one fire out approach, are the area under the receiver operating characteristic curve, AUC, and the classification error rate. Higher AUC values indicate better model performance and lower classification error rate uh, values indicate better model performance. So stepping out uh, to the, the, the broad view, what you'll notice is the fur models perform best, the conifer models perform more moderately, and the pine recruitment models uh, perform less well uh, with uh, you know, a, a fair amount of room for improvement there. Uh, the next thing uh, I'll draw your attention to, the models are ordered uh, by their performance, uh, by their AUC score. So for conifer, and with the top one being uh, the best performing model. So for the conifer recruitment models, the best performing model incorporated mean post-fire precipitation in the first three years post-fire. For fur recruitment, you had two models uh, sort of nearly tying for the best performance. You can see their classification error rate is exactly the same and AUC scores are just a little bit off from each other. So the top one by AUC score was actually historical precipitation. It didn't include a metric of post-fire precipitation. But the next one that performs basically equivalently well used uh, precipitation in the four years uh, following the fire. And those two variables are highly correlated. It can be difficult when there's some noise in the data for model, models to uh, choose which of those two variables is actually driving the relationship. But it seems to me more parsimonious to, to think that it's post-fire climate that's driving post-fire regeneration as opposed to historical climate that's driving post-fire regeneration. Certainly there are mechanisms there and we could discuss that more if folks have questions. And then the pine recruitment model, uh, the, the two uh, climate variables included in the best performing model were precipitation anomaly in the first three years post-fire, and then also historical precipitation. So these are response curves for the conifer generation model. Everything looks good. Curves are in the expected dire uh, directions. Um, so things look good here. Um, and then here are spatial predictions and a reliability diagram for the conifer regeneration model. You can see a nice tight relationship between predicted probability of regeneration and then the observed frequency as it might be experienced by uh, on new fires that uh, managers are applying the model to. And then in the bottom right, you've got a, a prediction akin to what the Shaiv et al model would predict, which is just under mean post-fire conditions, probability of regeneration mapped across that landscape. And then the left four panels show uh, probability of regeneration under four different scenarios. So on the top, you've got low precipitation scenarios. On the bottom, you've got high precipitation scenarios. On the left, you've got low seed production scenarios. And on the right, you've got high seed production scenarios. And you can see there's a substantial amount of variation between uh, predicted regeneration between those four different scenarios. So managers might be interested in that just to bracket what their expectation might be for post-fire regeneration, or they might have some inference about what post-fire conditions might be for a variety of potential reasons, either because they're not planting seeds until a few years after the fire, which is often the case with the NEPA planning process, because they've gone out with binoculars and done cone surveys and looked at how many cones are on the branches of trees, so have idea about what the seed production might be, or because we've got um, some decent moderate ability to predict whether we're going to be in an El Nino or La Nina conditions one to two years into the future. So here we've got response curves for fur generation. Again, everything looks good, uh, aligns with what our prior expectations of what the curves might look like. And here we've got uh, the, the spatial prediction and the reliability diagram. Again, the reliability diagram looks very nice, nice tight relationship there. And what you'll notice about the scenarios here is you've got a very different spatial pattern predicted for fur regeneration than you had for 
all conifers as a whole. And that's because a large portion of the fur regeneration model is uh, driven by fur seed availability. So this gives you an idea where furs are gonna regenerate as opposed to all conifers as a whole. Here we've got marginal response curves for pioneer regeneration, no problems here. Everything aligns with expectations and spatial predictions and a reliability gram, diagram for the pine model. What you'll notice about the reliability diagram is again, there is uh, room for improvement here, but the model still is providing useful information to managers, albeit with uncertainty uh, in that prediction about what to expect. So what are the uh, implications here? Um, uh, you can see in black is historical precipitation. Blue shows uh, a relatively wet future scenario. And then orange shows a relatively dry scenario, more in line with what we're uh, more and more expecting for California and what we've seen in the, the recent past. So you can see uh, probability of conifer recruitment could decline significantly uh, if we're experiencing more and more dry conditions, especially post fire. Um, and then applying that uh, to space, on the right-hand side, you can see a cross-section of the west slope of the Sierra Nevada. And you can see, especially for low to moderate ele elevations associated with the, the approximate lower elevation limit of conifer forest, you can see pretty substantial declines in the probability of regeneration there, indicating that declines in regeneration probability from changing climate um, uh, are, are likely to be a mechanism that's contributing to upslope range contraction in coniferous forests or loss of coniferous forests from the lowest elevations. And with that, I will turn it back over to Micah for a demo of our tool. Micah, go on ahead and unmute yourself. Thank you. <laughs> All right. So this is a this is a tool that we built um, incorporating Joseph's model, um, and it's a uh, we we ended up distributing it as an R package. And what it is is a is a shiny app, um, which I'll launch here. Um, the, the R package all it does is exports this one function. Um, this launch app function, which brings you to this this page, and a shiny app is just a way um, where you can use use this interactive web browser to run our code. Essentially, um, what you see when you first pull it up is the model geographic domain, um, and that's just showing where, like roughly where um, the model should be applicable. Um, it will predict actually outside of that, um, but it'll, you'll give a warning. Um, and there are actual bounds too on its prediction area. It won't predict outside of um, several, there's some eco regions, but that's all spelled out in this about tab here. I um, mean, I should mention before I start that Joseph has actually done some really good work to extend this model or this, this app. Um, so the first thing you do is you load a, uh, oops, you load an RDMBR file in a TIFF format, and this is available from uh, RabG or Ravage. And then you upload a zipped fire perimeter. So this is from the Delta fire. Um, and it's just a shape file, all, all, the, all the parts zipped up. And then you uh, click this predict regeneration button and it'll zoom in on the fire and that'll tell you, show you where your fire is, make sure everything looks good. Um, you got the RDMBR layer there, and the fire perimeter. Um, and now what it'll do is it's actually grabbing uh, the some pre-processed data so that those C predict the, the sea prediction layers and uh, the, some of the climate data sets um, from the cloud. And so this will take probably like, I'm gonna guess a couple of minutes maybe or so. Um, while that's happening, we can, uh, what can we do? So it's got this pretty extensive um, documentation tab that explains um, a lot of the a lot of the methods that Joseph just talked about. Oh, here we go. Looks like it's actually working. 
So now it's predicting the regeneration probability for each of those scenarios. So there's like the low precipitation, low seed, et cetera. Almost there. All right. So what it'll do is it'll render this map showing the probability of regeneration for conifers um, that, at the, for the uh, average scenario. And so uh, you can pick either the low seed, low precip scenario, high seed, high seed, precip scenario, and this map is zoomable. Um, you can pick different backgrounds if you want to look at that. Um, Go back to the mean here. You can apply a conifer forest mask. And this is uh, derived from CalVeg. And the idea was simply to, um, you don't want to be making inferences about predictions uh, where it doesn't make sense. And I would like, so this isn't necessarily, this, this conifer forest mask is sort of a rough, sort of just allows you to get a first pass look at like, okay, maybe we shouldn't be worrying if, you know, there's low, low, low predicted probability in places where there wouldn't be conifers anyway. Um, you can select different taxonomic groups. So we can select firs instead of conifers. And there's different, you know, there's aesthetic thing like uh, different color palettes. Um, you, can down, you can then download the data. So what this will actually do is Download it to your downloads folder. And you actually get a, a TIFF, so which you can load into ArcMap or whatever um, with associated metadata for each um, taxonomic group and each scenario. You can also look at a histogram um, of the probabilities for each taxonomic group and scenario. And then you can download this figure uh, as well. There we go. All right, I think that's basically that's taken up most of our time. Um, I guess I'll turn it back over to the hosts. Yeah, great. Thank you, Micah. And thank you, Phil and Joe, as well. Uh, we do have some questions coming in if um, you guys are up for answering these. So uh, Don Falk's asking, out of curiosity, what prevents seed predation, for example, by rodents from the seed traps? So there, there are boxes that have a screen. And so the screen is big enough that seeds can fall in, but rodents can't get in, at least ideally. Um, there are cases like if I think there's and it's uh, where you, we lose seed traps because bear gets in it or something like that. Um, but ideally, the the screen should prevent that from happening. Okay. Uh, next question: Are there any efforts being made to work with local indigenous peoples who would likely have some experience with regenerating forests after fire? You know, I've reached out to some indigenous uh, folks uh, that I've worked with in the past and not struck up any uh, productive collaborations yet. One of the thing I heard, one of the things I heard is that um, indigenous folk oftentimes feel overwhelmed by requests for feedback. But certainly I would love to, to have some indigenous folks to give feedback on, on these if anybody has any suggestions. Yeah, thanks, Joe. And um... Yeah, let's talk about that later because we could work with our tribal liaison here, potentially. Okay, uh, another question from Don. Would you expect strong selection for seedling survival under emerging conditions? Like for different species, perhaps? We didn't look at that, but that is an important question. Um, and I don't know the answer there. Okay. Uh, 
Last question for now, unless I missed it, uh, Joe, you didn't talk about brush competition. So um, Stephen's asking, he says he suspects that on the King fire that the primary seed germination has been brush, not trees. So before I answer that, actually just stepping back, I will mention that David Wright has an interesting publication that looks at uh, climate elevation and uh, seed regeneration that might be useful for this inference about seed selection um, and climate. Um, but yeah, in terms of shrubs, we have uh, post-fire shrub data. Um, uh, uh, Derek Young analyzed some of that in his uh, looking for effects of post-fire weather. Um, and that certainly could be incorporated into the tool. We could make predictions for shrubs. The shrubs should be implicitly incorporated in the predictions for the other species, but certainly there is a chance that by, you know, uh, doing a hierarchical model that models shrubs and then uh, takes those shrub regeneration probabilities into account for uh, predicting conifer regeneration, that could lead to potential improvement in the model. So that, that would be a fruitful area for additional work. Okay. Uh, next question, can new burn severity data be used in the decision support model and could finer scale sentinel data be used? Mm, I, I think there would, with sentinel finer scale data, um, certainly it could be used. The tool is not currently formatted for that. So it would require some updates, probably particularly with respect with the resolution of the other predictors or just on the fly reprojection of that or something along those lines in order to incorporate that. But yeah, the tool does currently use new burn severity data. So as soon as that new burn severity data is available, you know, which the satellites have flown, you know, within a couple of weeks after the fire, it is possible to make these predictions. I think RAVG generally takes a little while longer to process the data into RNDBR and they're, you know, performing checks on the data for cloud cover and fine tuning things. So those are probably the ones to go with. But if you were in a hurry, you could process the RNDBR uh, yourself just a couple of weeks after the fire to uh, using the Landsat imagery to, to create the projections, pr predictions. Okay. Uh, okay, Kyle Rodman is asking, do you all have any sense of how variable the seed trap data was between the two National Park Service sites? Micah? MK sites. Um, I would say it's more like varied more on by, by genus than between sites. Um, there wasn't a huge difference, as I recall, between parks, if that answers the question. Yeah, uh, yeah. I'm not sure if we we've, we've split it out that way ever. Uh, typically, the, there's more variation uh, in terms of elevation, and so, uh, but the the force composition between the Yosemite and the Sequoia sites at similar elevations are pretty much the same. I'm remembering your question actually jogs my memory. I did do a quick little exploratory analysis into the, the spatial extent, the spatial correlation in those masting years and those patterns. And there is pretty strong uh, correlation between when masting years or dearth of seed production years occurred, even at very far away plots. Okay. Uh, this next question is for Micah. You mentioned that pollination is typically more successful in drier years. Could you explain that a little bit more? Does it have to do with better pollen transmission through the air? That's my, yeah, that's my understanding. I think it may be as simple as like washing the, the pollen out of the air. There's, um, oh, I'm forgetting the name. Uh, Keonig, I think, has a, has a paper on uh, masting in oaks that looks at that. Um, but yeah, I think it is, and it can be. It, it's a, it, It's actually kind of hard to determine because that's you know precipitation that can literally be you know it's, it's such a fine scale thing. So you could actually conceivably you could imagine that there could be high precipitation. Then if you had like a warm and dry spell for a couple of weeks, that then that would have no effect, you know. But uh, yeah, it's essentially. Uh, I think you know once the pollen gets wet and on the ground, it's less effective, or doesn't disperse as well. I should say. Okay, thanks. Oh, another question. Uh, what was the resolution of the climate data used in the model and how did that influence your spatial predictions of seedling regeneration? Uh, 
<laughs> Sorry, I was muted. Um, we're using climate data downscaled by uh, the flints from USGS. So that's downscaled down to 270 meters using their methods and then using bilinear interpolation down to 30 meters past that. Okay, any other questions? Okay, Dave Brashears, any thoughts um, if seed limitation or seedling slash sapling mortality might be more limiting during hotter drought? Good question. Sorry, I was distracted. Can you repeat that? Or somebody else want to jump in with an answer? Any thoughts if seed limitation or seedling or sapling mortality might be more limiting during a hotter drought? Well, uh, one of the take homes from uh, Micah's work was that the seed production was relatively insensitive to drought uh, in terms of uh, for those trees that did survive. Uh, my guess would be, and from some earlier work that we did with some seedling plots, is that uh, the seedlings are very sensitive to sort of interannual changes in climate. So if you've got a drought year, that generally kills off a lot of the seedlings. Uh, you know, how, how widely that applies, you know, beyond uh, Sierra Nevadas, I imagine it would be similar, but you know, I, I haven't looked at data personally like that. My thinking is that it's very context dependent, right? So. Um, if you already have a fair amount of seed production, increasing, because you've got nearby seed sources, increasing or decreasing that's not gonna have a huge effect on regeneration. Whereas uh, changes in uh, the moisture conditions post-fire are gonna drive bigger differences. But if you're in an area that's more seed limited, seed availability is gonna play a bigger role there. Yeah. Okay, any other questions? Uh, if you do think of any other questions, feel free to um, email myself and I can uh, relay your questions to the presenters. Uh, I typed in the chat window that this recording will be posted on our website early next week. Um, and you can also find all of our past webinar recordings at, at that link as well. Um, and with that, I think we will adjourn a couple minutes early. Thank you very much, Micah, Joe, and Phil uh, for sharing your, your research and this um, new tool with us today. Great presentation, thank you. Thanks everyone for organizing and showing up.